In 1994, Dave Grohl received a call saying that Kurt Cobain had died, and then a few moments later, they called back saying, no way, he's not dead. I was just numb, I was confused, I was already in mourning. When he actually died, I was totally non-emotional. I didn't even know if I was in shock, I was just shut down. I remember trying to make myself cry and I couldn't. But after Cobain's death, the media went into a frenzy. It made me so fucking angry. It made me so angry that nothing was sacred anymore. So Grohl decided to be the one to be quiet, going away from the public eye to be with a few close friends and family to go travelling. But he still kept up with bassist Chris Novelesic to ask how each other were doing. Grohl shied away from music, as for a while, every time he played or listened to music, he just thought of his friend who had passed away. Imagine going into the bedroom full of things every day. That's exactly how music felt to me, because that was my whole world. After Kurt died, I couldn't even listen to a fucking Colonel song. I couldn't listen to any music for fear that the refrain would have some minor chord in it that would make me bawl. I remember I went to see that stupid fucking Backbeat movie shortly after Kurt died and I knew that when Stu Sutcliffe died, I wouldn't be able to handle it. I knew. Backbeat was a film released on the 14th of April 1994. Nine days after Kurt Cobain died, Dave Grohl was a part of the band that recorded the soundtrack for the film. After his friend died, he would still have to appear with the Backbeat Band, as they were called, for the 1994 MTV Movie Awards on the 4th of June, where they performed the Beatles version of Money, That's What I Want. After the performance, Grohl met Mike Watt, bassist for bands such as Firehouse and The Stooges, and Watt asked him about being on his first solo album, Ball Hog or Tugboat. They went to Robert Lang's studio in Seattle to record, and Grohl would end up being the drummer for the first two tracks on the album, Brain Train and Against the Seventies. After the recordings from Mike Watts, Grohl decided that he wanted to do something similar. I thought, okay, I'm going to get my shit together and demo some stuff at home, and then book a session for myself. He booked a week at Robert Lang's studio, the same one he recorded in with Mike Watt, to record some songs he had written over the past six years. I was really prepared. I had demoed the songs and I knew what the arrangements were. I knew what I was going to do with the drums and I'd figured out the guitar. That would be the most time I had ever spent in the studio recording stuff of my own. Taking inspiration from Stuart Copland's Clark Kent album, he wanted people to be able to listen to it objectively, not just as an album by the drum of Nirvana. He created the pseudonym Foo Fighters after the name given to UFOs by Allied aircraft pilots in World War II. He also didn't want the album to be a major release, so he started the record label Roswell Records. So I'm sorry to say, but I don't know the exact dates that the Foo Fighters album was recorded, because on Wikipedia it says it was recorded between the 17th and the 23rd of October 1994, but that's seven days, and... Yeah, the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 20th, yeah, just making sure. All right. Yeah, that's seven days. But then further down on the Wikipedia page, it says it took him six. And then in a 2009 interview with Kerrang, uh, Dave Grohl says it took him five. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where they got that, 20, uh, that 17th to 23rd, uh, to 23rd date from, because I couldn't find it anywhere else. And, well, to be fair, it might just been me being a bit lazy. But... Um, <laughs> that probably is, but yeah, I couldn't find it anywhere else. Um, it was probably down in there, like the sources, references bit, but um, it was pro yeah, yeah, if it was there, it's probably behind a paywall or in a book somewhere that I don't have access to, so yeah, that's probably it, but yeah, so just yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's probably safe to say that it was in that range it was recorded between the 17th and 23rd but i just yeah i just uh, i just want to be clear i don't know exactly but yeah sorry about the um interruption uh, back to the story dave grohl and producer barrett jones would enter the studio in the morning and the recording would begin at about midday as grohl would be doing all the parts of each song he would run around like a madman greg dolly was the only person in the studio apart from grohl and jones and he would admit the following year that he was absolutely mesmerized He'd do a whole song in about 40 minutes. I was completely fascinated by it. He could do it because he has perfect time. He'd lay down a perfect drum beat and work off that. He played drums, run out and play bass, and then put down two guitar layers over the top and sing it. Dully was the only person on the album apart from Grohl. While watching Grohl record, Grohl asked him if he wanted to play and Dully would end up playing the guitar on the track Ecstatic. Grohl has said that he has been insecure about his voice. In an interview with Q, he said that while other singers double-tracked their audio to make it sound better, he quadrupled it. Like the recording, the mixing was very fast. Barrett Jones said in a response to a forum post that the mixing was nothing crazy and that he mixed Big Me in 20 minutes. 
Initially, Dave Grohl didn't give the album much weight, not thinking of it any more than the 10 track cassette only album Pocket Watch that he released in 1991 under the pseudonym Late. But when I heard I'll Stick Around for the first time mixed, I kind of had an anxiety attack because I finally realised that this was good. I thought, oh shit, this is real. I'll Stick Around was one of the three songs on the album that Grohl wrote after the death of Kurt Cobain, along with the songs This Is A Call and Oh George. Producer Garrett Jones said that he always knew that this album would be more than what Grohl initially gave it credit for. I knew we were making a big album. After the dissolution of Nirvana, Dave Grohl was approached by many bands to join as a drummer. It was strongly rumoured that Grohl would join the band Pearl Dram, but this was never genuinely considered by Grohl. In October 1994, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers lost their drummer Stan Lynch and with an upcoming gig on Saturday Night Live for the 19th of November, they needed a new drummer desperately. So we thought, first of all, who's a great drummer? Dave Grohl is our favourite drummer right now and he isn't doing anything. So I called Dave's office, he phones back and was really keen to do it. Dave Grohl would stay with the Heartbreakers and perform with them for their SNL appearance, after which Tom Petty asked Grohl if he would want to join the band permanently. Chris Mundy of the Rolling Stone describes how Grohl portrayed the situation in his 1995 interview. Grohl sits in the van and holds two fingers out so close that they're almost touching. I was this close to joining, he says. It was so much fun. I was really scared. I was most afraid that they had watched MTV's Unplugged and decided to get me from seeing that. But when we rehearsed, they treated me like I was in the band. It was such an honour. But I figured that I was 26 years old and didn't want to become a drummer for hire at the age of 26. After the completion of the Foo Fighters album, Dave Grohl sent it out to friends and family to see what they thought. But the demo would end up getting into the hands of many labels, all wanting to sign Foo Fighters. Foo Fires would end up getting signed by Capitol after Grohl was courted by Capitol President Gary Gersh, who would sign Nirvana. While Grohl recorded the first album by himself, he still needed to fill out the band for live gigs and future recordings. During 1994, the band Sunny Day Real Estate began to fall apart, officially breaking up in 1995. With the breakup of Sunny Day Real Estate, bassist Nate Mendel and drummer William Goldsmith were now available. Grohl asked the pair to join Foo Fighters and they both agreed. While Goldsmith would end up leaving the band in early 1997, Mendel has stayed with the Foo Fighters ever since. After securing Mendel and Goldsmith, Grohl gave the demo tape to Pat Smear, who was a touring guitarist with Nirvana. He said, God, this stuff is really poppy. I'm like, really? He goes, I love it. Wow, thanks. We're looking for a guitar player. He's like, I'll do it. I'm like, you will? Smith would stay with Foo Fighters until mid-1997. He would rejoin Foo Fighters in mid-2010 and has been with the band ever since. Now with the band completes, they would rehearse for a few months and the first public gig was on the 23rd of February 1995 at the Jambalaya Club in Arcata, California. Followed by gigs at Satyricon in Portland on the 3rd of March and the Velvet Elvis in Seattle the following day. Their first major tour was opening for Mike Watt for his tour, and Dave Grohl would feature alongside a Watt as a part of the backing band for much of the tour. Their first single, This Is A Call, would be released on the 19th of June, hitting number 35 in the US and 5 in the UK. The Foo Fighters album would be released on the 4th of July in 1995 to positive reviews and would hit number 23 in the US and number 3 in the UK. I'll Stick Around for All The Cows and Big Me would all be released as singles after the release of the album. I'll Stick Around would be released on the 4th of September and hit number 18 in the UK. For All The Cows would be released on the 20th of November and hit number 28 in the UK. And Big Me would be released on the 25th of February 1996 and hit number 19 in the UK.